Good morning, Cornerstone family. Uh, it is an honor to get to be here with y'all today. Uh, again, my name is Hunter. I just want to welcome y'all to Cornerstone this morning. Um, and so the first thing that I want to do is I want to share with y'all a message I got from Mike this morning. Um, Pastor Mike uh, sent me this message uh, to give an update about Heather and how she's doing. So I'm going to share this with y'all. Uh, he said, Heather is making slow but steady progress, but we're still dealing with pain. Please continue to pray for her. Uh, she misses being here and loves you all. Um, and hopefully his goal, uh, Pastor Mike's goal, is to be here uh, back next week with another update. So just continue to be in prayer for Heather. She's still doing well. She's still progressing, um, but still pain that she has to deal with. Um, so just continue to be in prayer for her about that. Um, and so uh, as we get ready to worship and uh, as we get ready to sing, um, the first song that we're going to be singing is of talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, and so this song talks about, you know, at the beginning of the world, uh, when God was creating everything, the Holy Spirit was there. And so that same Holy Spirit that was present at the beginning of the creation is with us now that Jesus has sent the Spirit to be with us, to help stir our affections for God, to help us be able to discern truth. And so as we begin to sing this song today, I want us to be thinking about how we have a helper that is with us, a helper that helps guide us in our faith, that helps stir our affections and our love for God, that helps us discern truth and wisdom. And so we're singing this first song today to help prepare our hearts and say, Lord, we need your Spirit to help stir our hearts for you, God. We need your spirit to help us discern truth and wisdom, God. We need your spirit to help us walk in a way that is worthy of you. And so, everybody stand to your feet and we're gonna worship God this morning.
pray with me? Father, we come before you, and God, we are grateful. Lord, you invite us to come to you. Lord, regardless of what state we're in, Lord, regardless of how we come to you, Lord, you call us, Lord, to seek you. And Lord, you welcome us with open arms. God, we don't have to clean ourselves up. Lord, we don't have to put on some different mask. Lord, we don't have to be somebody that we're not. Lord, you accept us as we are. But God, you don't leave us that way. God, you transform us into the image of your son, God. You call us to become more like you. And so, God, we are grateful that we don't have to clean ourselves up, God, that we don't have to present ourselves in a certain way, but God, you take our sorrow and you trade it for joy. Because God, that is the kind of God that you are. Lord, you accept us how we are, but God, you don't leave us that way. And so God, I pray that whatever we're searching for this morning, God, whatever we're looking for, God, I pray that anybody who's here that's searching for something, God, that they know that everything that they're looking for is found in you. God, everything is found in you. Everything that we need is from you. So God, we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we trust you and we love you. In a certain name we pray, amen. Let me have a seat. So as y'all know, Pastor Mike is still with Heather. His goal is to try to be here next week to share an update um, about how she's progressing. But today it is my honor and joy to get to share with y'all that we have a guest speaker, uh, Taylor Drenzik. He is from Joy Church. Uh, Shall I give it up for uh, Pastor Taylor? It's good to be back, Cornerstone. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. You know, I love when I come here because it means I could vent the crazy somewhere else for a Sunday. It's wonderful. I'm not going to lie, though. Like a parent leaving a toddler behind, I've been staring at my watch and my phone like, is everything okay while I'm not there? And I have like someone like texting me updates almost like a spy. (laughs) I love you, Joy. When you watch this, I want you to know that. It's because I care that I'm a helicopter parent. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, man. So you were supposed to start a series for Advent last week. And then some things happened where another friend of Cornerstone named George Russ also has been going through a time in this way. Oh no. There we go. Okay. (laughs) And so normally the order of Advent would go typically in an evangelical tradition as follows. Hope, peace, joy, love. But that's been a little topsy-turvy today, and I find that to be interesting within the providence of God that you would get two weeks about grief and then immediately just zoom into joy. I find that fantastic that God would subvert our expectations in such a way to go from how to deal with grief to joy. I also want you to know that these pink boots were very strategically picked because there's colors associated with that, and the one for joy is pink. Beautiful. I'll, I'll Nancy Sinatra, yes. Yes, I'll, for, yes for you. The worship team's asking me to. But no, nah, no. Nah. In, all, in all seriousness, though, please pray with me as we enter into the time of the word. So, Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can come approach you, God. That you're not a God so distant from us. That you're not a God who leaves us in our tears. That you're not a God who leaves us hopeless or peaceless or without joy or without love. God, we know it is because of your love that we have hope that's not put to shame. We know, God, that through this we have been given peace that we can move forward. And God, that all of this results in an exuberant joy, God. And I I thank you for that. So God, may the meditations of my heart be a pleasing fragrance unto thee, God. And I pray all this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful. But I know it's been difficult. I've been here a lot lately throughout the week. I've seen a lot of you while I've been here on certain either Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm just here a lot. (laughs) And I've been running in and hearing the stories of what's going on in your lives individually and as a church. And I want you to know, I hear you. Pastor Mike hears you too. The times that you're going through, it's real. 
the health issues, the deaths, some who have gone back to prison, amongst other things. It's okay. It's okay. And I wanted to share something with you that we were sharing through the prayer visuals we were having a couple weeks ago on behalf of Heather. And we, we would typically open with Psalm 46, 1 through 3, which says the following, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, though it's all hit in the fan, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Amen? Amen. That was weak sauce. Amen? Amen? Thank you. But it does feel like that sometimes, that all of creation stands against us. Yeah? It feels like the mountains in the world are coming and crashing down around us. That the waters of the bay are rising. Well, they might actually be rising, but rising up against us. It feels like our life needs a bigger insurance policy sometimes. And it hurts. And you fight through it. You endure. But it takes a toll. Right? I know what it's like. I think the last two times I was here, I was sharing about some of my own health ailments that I go through. You know, for those of you not in the know, a big part of my story, of my, of my personal testimony, is just continuous health issues from the time I was a boy. My first memory is actually dying in an ambulance when I was three years old. And that's been, I've been a meme ever since. <laughs> that's been the trajectory of my life, is continuous health issues. But I've discovered in that time that when you know that God is your refuge and strength, that nothing can stop you. For you know then, therefore, that God is good. And two years ago, I got really rocked on the Veranzano Bridge. You know, I'm still kind of concussed every day. I got eight busted vertebrae. I still got problems in my hands sometimes amongst other things going on. But that hasn't robbed me of an ounce of joy in the long run. This don't work the way it used to. You know, I'm becoming the jalopy on the road. You know what I mean? I like to think I'm some sort of hot rod. But at the end of the day, I know I'm what the 16-year-old kid with $500 can afford to drive. But that's okay, man. Why? Because something I've discovered is the same God who's our refuge and strength in Psalm 46 when it feels like the mountains are swallowing us and the sea is taking us is the same God of Isaiah 55, 12 through 13 when it says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. Whoa. And instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, meaning out of the ground, instead of things that prickle you, there'll be life. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. You know, the creation that tends to scare us, the mountains that crumble around us, the trees that the only time we see them clap their hands here is when a hurricane comes, and they're whipping back and forth like so. Unto God, when he enters the room, the mountains start singing to him. The trees start clapping their hands. Jesus, upon his arrival, it says in Luke, the Pharisees tell him, will you not tell your disciples basically to shut up? And Jesus says, no, for if these people do not cry out, even the stones will cry out to me. All of creation, the thing that's scaring you, the thing that is tearing your life apart, bows down before the King of Kings in such a way that it must shout his praises out, which unto you is a great joy. Meaning, you could be hitting the bottom of your barrel today. You'd be coming in and the garbage hit the fan a long time ago. And you're here busting your own jalopy on fumes, you know what I'm saying? And you're coming into church like, what's good, pastor? And I'm telling you, God's good. Amen. And I'm telling you, the very thing that's tearing you apart is the very thing that's going to draw you near to God. For the, for the crumbling mountain in your life is the one that sings praise unto him under his power and his strength. That's what we're coming in hot with today. That's what we're coming in hot with today. I could spend my whole time theologically explaining joy, and we'll be here for a lifetime. I got a tattooed on my arm. It's the name of my church. You know, I can go on for a while with this. But I don't want to do that. I want to give you a shorter definition of joy, and I want you to leave here today experiencing the joy of the Lord, because joy, while defined, is something that's much more aptly experienced. Yeah? 
Meaning, I could spend my life right now describing to you a fine meal, you know? And if you're like 20 in the room, you don't know what a fine meal is yet. <laughs> if you're like 30 and you got a job, you know what a meal is. But let's say you go somewhere decent. See, I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just white trash from the South Shore, so I have no conception of this North Shore place. So, you know, for me... <laughs> Shout out to Shirley. But, but, nah, man. This is, hey, this is how we do on Sunday morning. Enjoy. They start, they start in three minutes right now. They're, t- they're talking about peace over there. They're going to get this message next week. But, <laughs> but if I was to go somewhere nice, right? Everyone ever been to like Lombardi's in the Bay or whatever? Yeah, there we go. Thank you, thank you for the participation, those of you who are giving this back to me. It feeds me. No. But it's a nice place. It's, it's also family friendly. This is not an advertisement. <laughs> but you go to such a restaurant as this, right? You sit down, you get your plate. And, you know, they, they bring out things like bread and courses. That's fine dining. Yo, it makes the outback look like the not uh I ain't coming back. <laughs> but, and then you order, let's say, something like a real steak, right? And then the, the plating, the plating... That's called presentation, the plating. And then you cut it. Also, pro tip, put the napkin on your lap. Young man, if you actually got the cash to take a woman on a date to one of these places, put the napkin on your lap. It will preserve your clothes and make you look classy. But when you go there and you put it on, you take that first bite, you put it to your mouth, nothing tastes the same ever again. Right? You have one good cut of meat somewhere. Or you go to one of the better wedding venues, and we're not going to name names right now because we're all feeling that one. (laughs) And you're like, this meal, when I eat this steak, I feel God's pleasure. (laughs) Eric Liddell said that, I think. No, but in all seriousness, when you experience the joy of the Lord for the first time, everything else washes away. And nothing stands in comparison So therefore, what is this joy? What's the definition I'm giving you today of this joy? Joy is a deep, enduring delight in God that surpasses pleasure in earthly things. I'll say it one more time because I'm seeing the yeah. Joy is a deep, enduring delight in God that surpasses pleasure in earthly things. That's the slowest I'm going to talk all day. (laughs) Actually, I take that back. I'm preaching at a Korean church later today. But (laughs) to which point... To which point, I, sl- I slow down for churches I don't feel quite as comfortable with yet. <laughs> but Cornerstone, we're family. We can do this. You have to deal with me. <laughs> but knowing the joy of the Lord is a deep and enduring pleasure. What else matters? What else matters? All of a sudden, that meal that was so great to me that made all other food not matter, that meal doesn't even matter anymore. You know, I, lo- I love music. M- music matter anymore, you know? Or in a more extreme sense, if you're still figuring out who God is or struggling in certain things, and when you're in a bad way, you go to the haagen and the Twinkies or the cookies, pick your poison, all of a sudden, I, it feels less pleasurable to partake in such things. I mean, let's, let's shoot straight here, pint of ice cream lovers. This isn't me. I'm lactose intolerant. They did just make non-dairy cherry Garcia. Uh, but... The first three bites of the pint, feeling pretty good, yeah? Halfway through the pint, you feel regret. (laughs) Bottom of the pint, even though your stomach is full, your heart feels empty. Because you chose to fill yourself with something that you knew was not enduring. Same way when you pound food, you know? Same way when you drink a lot. Same way when you're doing drugs. Same way when you're cheating on your spouse or looking at pornography on the internet. It's just cheap crap. It ain't joy. But we run to it thinking it will provide us joy. And that's the lie of sin. That we will find joy in it and that it will fulfill us on our own terms. Our own knowledge of what is good and what is evil. Oh yeah, I feel the hush. (laughs) I'm not shaming you. I ain't, remember, remember, remember where I passed her. We ain't got no shame in Shirley. (laughs) 
Ain't got no shame in Shirley. This is actually, I'm really dressed up right now for you guys. I wore my nice boots. But, and a, I wore a sweater. I even wore a sweater that coordinates with my beard. Come on. But, you know what I mean? That's effort. Effort, it's for you guys. I'm, I'm not shaming you. But I need you to feel the weight of sin. Because if you appreciate not the weight of sin, you will never understand the glory of grace. You will never appreciate the trueness of joy if you don't understand how disgusting sin is. If the mountain is crumbling around you, if you feel like you're getting tore up into the sea, don't run to the haagen or any of the other stuff I listed. Run to God with the anticipation that he will meet you with pleasure. Stand for, stand, uh, be strong in the Lord and stand, uh, be, and be strong in the Lord and stand in the strength of his might. Sound familiar? Ephesians 6, you know, men, men's ministries love that passage, right? Right? You know, I'm 30. I grew up in the 2000s. I feels like every time my dad would bring me to an event, it would be like some cheesy video about wearing the armor of God. And then I left knowing less about the armor of God than before. <laughs> it's a little poke at Christian culture. But so, and, and they tell you to stand strong in God, and once you're able to stand firm, you know, like, gird yourself with these concepts in the Bible. But no one knows what it means to stand strong, because I've seen so many people, myself included, fold like a cheap suit. That's another thing, young man. If you got the cash, go a step up from the clearance rack. <laughs> Just for your suits. I know I'm not a suit guy, but... I know, I know the tertiary point of this message has nothing to do with you, young men, and I'm trying not to pick on you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. By the way, the point being, you fall— <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm taking so much time out to make fun of the young men a little bit and try and help them along. I'm like losing my place in my own notes right now. But the point of it all is this. In order to stand strong and stand firm, we need to untangle that mystery so that you can stand, so that you can fight, so that you do turn to joy, so that you don't turn to the metaphorical haagen -Dazs. Can we just wrap everything up and just call it haagen today? Is that cool with everybody? Yeah? Yeah, you feel a little bit better about that? Okay, good. I, li I like the yes pastor nods going on. Well, there's something really interesting that I've discovered about, this, about the strength of God, about his might, and trying to stand strong in it, and that's twofold. One, he's the one who stands strong. You're the one that stands in him. You're not standing in your might, you know? I could buy the best steel-toed boots on the market, but at the end of the day, I'm five foot eight, maybe, and could get knocked over relatively easy. I, I have finite might, because I'm a finite person. That is, I have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But God's might, his dynamis, his ability to do things, is endless. So you got to learn to put yourself standing up so that God stands up in you. But then how do we then therefore lean on God and his strength? Well, there's this funny little verse in Nehemiah. Funny little thing in Nehemiah. And I know you guys like Nehemiah because Pastor Mike references it every other day. But he says as he's doing an impossible task that God is calling him to, he says the following. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy strengthens the arm that you use to swing the sword of God's word. The difference between a hollow verse being given out and your ability to swing it with power is your experience of joy found in God. Because if you're enjoying God, if you're delighting in Him, that means you're treasuring Him and submitted to Him. Joy is the fruit of that. Fruit of that. Sound familiar? It's the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. So, if you want to get past the crumbling mountains and the foaming sea. You want to get past the metaphorical pint of hagen -Dazs. Discover what it means to give yourself over to a joy that's found in God. And it will strengthen you. And the crashing mountain becomes the singing one. And the foaming sea becomes the parted one. And the thorn becomes the myrtle. Cyprus, excuse me, that's a tree. <laughs> I love that so much. I love it so much. I really do. What, what would my life be without joy? What would it be but following God out of fear and devotion? Or fearful devotion? 
which is an important component of our walk with God, that we would have a reverent respect for who he is, like a good parent and following him. But it doesn't end there. It starts there. When you're walking with him, that joy that strengthens you starts to overwhelm you and starts to change who you are. And you start treasuring just him and everything else kind of falls to the wayside and you know you can make it through. So cool. So, so cool. But I want you to know that this joy that's found in God, yes, of course, you experience it when you lean, in, lean into, per se, reading the word and getting to know him there and in your prayers and in the worship moments where we're throwing ourselves mentally, emotionally into the praise of God and who he is. But there's other means of, of being lifted into the joy of the Lord. This is a big buckshot on joy. You want to email me sometime? We'll talk about it. But in Psalm 122, it's this Psalm of David. And my man David is writing what's called a song of ascent, meaning there are some holy days that the Jews had to observe in the Old Testament, and everybody had to congregate on Israel. They didn't have cars, they didn't have 495 to like hop on down and go through and like honk a camel in traffic. So they had to just straight up walk. And they would sing certain songs on the way there. And this is one of them. And David's song, or one of the songs David wrote, that they would sing on their way to go to Jerusalem, up the mountain, to hit the temple for the holy day, starts as follows. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Now, you're like, how's that cool, Taylor? David's just saying, yeah, it's cool, we're going to church. No, it's so much deeper than that. There's so much more to that. Because the rest of it says, Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. Like David really delineates the process of them being one nation worshiping God in this. But this first verse, he says, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Meaning, David's joy isn't just being here, per se, and experiencing God. You know, in, in like the moment of like, yeah, this sermon's doing something for me, or yeah, the worship and prayer is doing something for me. He is experiencing that, but he was also glad when they said to him, let's do this. Meaning, David's joy in the Lord wasn't just him and God, but he was brought further joy when the people around him presented it to him. Are you a source of the joy of the Lord for the people around you, or are you just a divider? That's all the choices you got. We don't do lukewarm middle grounds in Christianity. And if you're there, I'm trying to spur you to heat right now so that you experience it. And if you choose to double down in your ways, you choose to say, nah, man, I'm sticking where I'm at, you're never going to experience joy with another person. You know? And if you're actively trying to divide, I'm going to throw a little shade on you right now. What does that mean? I'm going to say get over yourself. Get over yourself. Your preferences, your qualms, your this, your that. You got beef? Squash it. You got thoughts about how things should go? Be biblical as you go about it. And I don't, I don't know your business in that kind of way. Again, I got my own problems and surely. But I'm saying this. I know what happens when Christian people don't actively try to bring each other joy. You either just exist and you're like, down the hall or, hey, good morning, dog, and then walk away, and that's all you do. Or even worse yet, because you don't know them and don't walk through life with them, share Jesus with them, learn joy in them, don't present joy to them, they just become a source to be under you in your mind. Gossips, divisions, etc. And that's no place in the house of God. No place in the house of God. Who do you got to reconcile with today? Because if you reconcile with someone else in this house of God, you and that person will experience a great joy that comes with repentance. Dude, experience, live in it. Live in it. I see the sweatiness. I know it's kind of warm in this room too. I didn't know it was going to be 59 degrees today. I chose poorly. But I know you're sweating a little bit right now too. Good. Live in it. Deal with the hard things, man. The best things come when you work through the hard things. Earn it. Earn it with one another. I won't say earn it with God because I don't mean to sound like a works-based salvation, but what I mean to say is sometimes in the same way that you got to put the hard work in with your friendships and your marriage, you got to put the hard work in with God and the brothers and sisters in Christ. 
But we get prideful. And we get shameful. Just throw that over there. Think of the joy that will enter your life when the divisions are gone, when the bitterness is gone, when the anger against God or man is gone. Beautiful things will happen. Glorious things will come in your life. Now, come on, man. I know, no. No one wants to laugh anymore. Look at me because now they're getting all cut. That's, that's what it should be. I promise you, I'm not trying to cut you. I'm, tr- I'm trying to exhort you to say there's great joy that abounds. And sometimes you got to work a little bit for it. And sometimes you got to work a little bit for it. Here, you guys might like this. There's a quote that I like, you know, you know from, from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And through 1956 to 1958, he had this sermon that he would kind of give and continuously give around as he would ask to speak. And it was called Paul's Letter to American Christians. It was written kind of like an epistle to American Christians in the 50s. And he had this to say, Through your scientific genius, you have made of the world a neighborhood. Now, this is the 50s. Forget internet. For, forget satellite. You know, bar- they barely had corded phones. The microwaves didn't exist till like 75, you know? We're pre-Beatles right now, pre-Temptations. We're in like the 50s. Like leave it to Beaver, Andy Griffith, like 50s. And he's commentating that through science, the world has shrunk and feels like a neighborhood. And I don't know, I've lived on Long Island most of my life, like basically all my life, sans two little stints elsewhere. What is the most that you get with your neighbors? And if you, like, really know them, like, really know them, can you get my mail? I'm going away for a week. Do you even know what the inside of your neighbor's house looks like? You know? I think of where I grew up in East Patchogue, and I, there's, of the next door, next door, across the street, I've been in across the street's house, and I still haven't been in next door, next door. My parents still live in East Patchogue. <laughs> you know? And my neighbors in Shirley, I'm getting to know them, and I'm like making some headway, and I'm like, this is weird, but this is good. You know? We don't get that far. We don't get that far. Even in church, though, we treat everyone like we're neighbors. But through a more, and Mel K goes on, but through your moral and spiritual genius, you have failed to make of it a brotherhood. Oh, Christian, you're not my neighbor, you're my brother and my sister. You're my brother and my sister. We got to be more than just, hey. I want to know that any one of us could turn around in this room and see someone who loves us in the Lord and can be a source of great joy for us. That's goals, man. That's goals. Because sometimes the way that God works through these things called people, through this thing called the body and the hands and feet, the way that he'll hold off the mountain from crumbling into you and turn it into something singing unto him is by other people going like this. But if you ain't got that brotherhood, you're not going to get that this. If you're visually impaired and you're watching this, I took a stomp down, put my hands up to connote shielding. No, there's two blind people in joy. That's not funny. If they listen to this, I want them to understand what I'm doing because I'm very visual. To which point, when you self-examine right now, do you see brothers and sisters around you or neighbors? Do you experience joy or bitterness? I want you to have joy. I want you to have brotherhood and sisterhood. I want when you walk into church to feel a super safe place to experience all these things together. You know, I want you to come to church and experience a deep, enduring delight in God that surpasses pleasure in earthly things. When you read the Bible, I want you to experience a deep, enduring delight in God that surpasses pleasure in earthly things. Same when you pray. Same when you're horsing around with each other. Same for the kids who go to youth group with each other. How much easier would your life be if you felt safe with each other to spur each other on to joy, which, oh, youth group kid, might just look like listening and praying with one another right now. And that's cool. When Jesus entered the world the first time, he brought joy that was foreign, that did not exist prior. His advent, his coming into the world, right? 
a gift unto us. When he comes back the second time, at the end of time, he finishes off what he starts, and he puts the seal on joy forever. That way, all we have is joy in him. You know, when it said, everyone loves the revelation, uh, every wipes away every tear, etc. Well, what happens when all your tears are wiped away? What happens when the sadness is gone? All that's left is joy. Why? Because we're in the presence of God forever. And I will see, hopefully, each and every one of you there. I want to make it to the end together, arm in arm. I can't do that if we don't do that together now. Uh, I'll offer you two final thoughts. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Though you have not seen him, Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, <coughs> you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You might have a hard time putting that definition on joy. You might have a hard time codifying how it comes. All you got to know is in the same way that you don't see God and that you love him, you might not see him, but you could experience real joy in him. I want you to have that. I know I've said it like 15 times now. I desperately, desperately want you to have the joy of the Lord. And the re a big reason why that's the name of our church, you know, and surely is there's a lot of sadness around me there. A lot of broken families, you know. A lot of issues with drugs and stuff. And we've been experiencing a, a good amount of baptisms lately, and that's cool. But the thing that brings me joy isn't just the act of the baptism itself. It's hearing the stories of the people transformed by God. The young man I'm thinking of right now he took 12 shots of Narcan to bring him back. That's got to be like a record. And it makes a profession of faith gets baptized like a week later. Like, that, that, exactly. Not, like, you know what I'm saying now. I see like the, whoa! That's the seed of joy. Because the angels of heaven will rejoice when but one comes to salvation, man. Exactly. So what you're experiencing was like, yes, on the inside. That's joy. Don't forget that. Hold it. Grab it. Seize it. Expand it. Do whatever you got to do, man. Or the woman three houses down who was a Jehovah's Witness who walks into church, hears preaching that Jesus is God and comes to faith. Her and her husband got baptized like two weeks ago. These are the stories. Exactly. Exactly. What is the story of God's faithfulness that you have to tell that brings you joy? I would love to hear it. I would love to hear it. And if you don't have one right now, I'd love for you to talk to me in the future and be like, yo, Taylor, I thought about what you said and put a lot of things aside and start to experience joy in my life and then promote that for other people, knowing that the gift that Jesus brings me when I, when I know that he's the God of hope, when I know that he brings me peace, is that it results in a joy that is otherworldly. That it protected my heart. That it changed my witness. That it started me actually evangelizing. That it healed the divides with the people that have in my life. Be like, yes. That's the testimony, dude. That's what's up. I'm going to leave you with a little benediction from Romans. This is how I'll choose to leave you. First, I'll pray, and then I'll give you this little benediction here. So, Lord God, may the people of Cornerstone experience the deep joy in you. Deep, deep, deep joy in you. Help them to treasure you above everything else, Jesus. Help them to cast aside every weight. Help them to cast aside divisions. Lord, help them to cast aside, Lord, even the trials that they experience, God, knowing that you are bigger than everything else, Lord. God, who cares at the end of the day about things like disease, knowing, God, that you're bigger? So, God, help us to put our weight in you and not just our earthly circumstances, our broken relationships, God. Lord, friendships can be mended and bodies can be healed, Lord. And that's the work of your hands. So help us, Lord, to have a deep joy in you and trusting everything that you're going to do today, God. So, Lord, 
bring us together for there is a great work that you are doing in this church and want to do through it god but first we got to get over ourselves and get onto you god and get into a deep joy lord found in you in order to move forward in such a vision and such a plan god and i pray also in your name lord jesus amen romans 15 13 may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the holy spirit you may abound in hope amen Let me have a seat. Just have a couple announcements to share with y'all. Uh, so, if you enjoyed this message, if you were encouraged by hearing about joy, uh, and if you know that somebody else in your life can benefit from hearing about joy, which I know we all do, uh, please uh, like, share, like, and share this video. Uh, we will be um, putting clips out on the internet for y'all to share as well. So. Uh, Please share this message because I know that we all need hope and joy. Um, and this is a great message about joy. Um, as well, um, if you want to get more connected to Cornerstone, there's a number on the screen that you can text 631 201 5520. If you're new to Cornerstone, you can text welcome. If you need prayer, you can text prayer. Um, if you want to give, you can text give. And church, if you'd like to be added to the Cornerstone group text, there is joy to be found here. Um, as, as Taylor has said, uh, you, there should be gladness when we hear about coming to church. I um, mean, we want Cornerstone to be a place where you know about things that are happening and you are glad when you get those texts that 
There are events that are happening. There are groups to join. Um, so text that number if, if you need to get connected or involved in Cornerstone. Um, and then uh, we have um, a, an app that you can download to get connected as well to find out more about things that are happening, get the updates about events that are happening or events being canceled because weather's been terrible these past couple months. I blame David and I for bringing the bad weather. That's our bad. We'll, we'll own that one. That's probably our fault for bringing bad weather. Um, but seriously, if you want to get involved, get connected, this is another great way to download the app. That way you're up to date on knowing all the things that are happening or maybe stop happening because of bad weather. Um, and then beyond that, just a couple of highlights uh, to share with y'all. Uh, connect at Cornerstone is this Friday, uh, 12, 15 uh, at 7 p.m. in the lobby. Um, this is perfect if you are new to Cornerstone. Uh, we'll have coffee, cake, and conversation uh, and who doesn't love alliteration, right? So we've got coffee, cake, and conversation. That's 12 uh, this Friday, 12.15 at 7 p.m. in the lobby right behind you. Um, and then uh, as well on Friday uh, from 7 to 9 p.m., we have Cornerstone Kids and Youth. I know the youth are having a Christmas party. Um, it's going to be great. There's going to be some ugly Christmas sweaters. David's going to be sharing the story of Jesus' birth, the Christmas narrative. It's going to be great. Um, I know kids are going to have a great time as well. That's, again, this Friday as well from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, on Thursday, uh, the day before that at 7 p.m., you kind of get the idea, everything's at 7 p.m., um, we will have an annual business meeting. Um, and don't worry, uh, it's, it's only for members, so if you're visiting, uh, you do not have to come to that. Uh, we're not asking just anybody who just attends um, maybe for their first time to show up, but this is for members uh, so, if, again, if you are a member of Cornerstone, we will have an annual business meeting, I'm assuming in here, uh, from uh, at 7 p.m. on Thursday the 14th. Um, and then just some other housekeeping things. Uh, we have the information center outside the sanctuary. If you have any questions, if you want to get connected to Cornerstone, if you want to know what that looks like, the information center is a great place to have any questions you have answered. If you want to get connected in a grow group, or if you receive Jesus today, that's a great place for you to be able to go to. And then lastly, we will have some prayer. We have a prayer team. Um, and so they will be up front um, and they would love to pray for you. If you need joy in your life, I know the prayer team would love to be able to pray for you for joy in your life. Or if you have joy and you want to rejoice with somebody, this is a great time to do so. Whatever you have going on in your life. Uh, coming up and having somebody pray for you is always, I think, the first thing that we should do is pray. Um, and so they will be up here to pray for you. I'm going to pray us out, um, and then y'all will be uh, dismissed. So God, we thank you for today, God. Lord, we thank you that you give us joy. Lord, that we don't have to just reside ourselves to just say, this is it. This is all that life can be, and it's just mediocre, and it's just average God, you don't deal with the average. You don't deal with the mediocre, but God, you give joy and abundance. God, that whatever we're going through, whatever problems we have in our lives, and God, sometimes there are many and sometimes there are few, but we're never without some problems. God, you can give us joy in the midst of that. Lord, you are bigger and stronger than whatever we have going in our lives. God, that you're not scared of what we're going through. God, you're not afraid of what we're going through. God, you're not afraid of our condition. God, we're never too dirty for you. God, we're never too far gone to receive joy. And so I pray that we would be encouraged in that. God, I pray that Taylor's message would help us experience joy in our lives. Maybe for the first time this week. Maybe for the first time we'll actually be able to experience true joy. God, that only comes from you. So, Father, we are grateful for that. Lord, we are grateful that you give us joy. So, Father, we trust you. Though the mountains may crumble, Lord, you still make a way. God, we trust you and we love you. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Y'all are dismissed.